Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings the message of hope in Jesus Christ. Let's look at our text this morning, beginning in verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. You see, Jesus here in this verse begins with a very bold and summarizing claim that his actions are completely dependent upon his obedience to God the Father. Not, now this is important for us to understand, not simply due to his submission to the Father, but rather because he is in absolute union to the Father. Now make sure we understand that. His actions are completely dependent on obedience. Not because he's sub, just been simply because he's submitting, but because he is in absolute, complete unity with the Father. There's two words that help us understand this relationship of unity or union with the Father. The first one is what we call, it's a, it's a, a word called homoousia. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion about this, about, about uh, the 5th century. It was, uh, a, uh, there was homoousia, it said similar substance. Homoousia describes the relationship between Jesus and the Father. And it means simply this, same substance. Homoousia, same substance as the Father. Now here's the implication of that. God the Son with no, now hear me, no subordinate characteristics in essence or being with the Father or the Spirit. That's what we mean by homoousia. Jesus is same substance with the Father. The second term that helps us understand this is a term impeccability. Unable to sin. And we've got to wrap our minds around this one because this takes a little bit of thought here. Unable to sin. Unable to disobey the will of the Father. Impeccable. Jesus was unable to disobey the will of the Father. Not because he couldn't sin. Not because he was tempted to sin but couldn't. But because Jesus was God. And as God, he was consumed with righteousness and holiness. See also his obedience to the will of the Father all the way to the cross. Adam was peccable. Able not, or able not to sin. That's what peccable means. Adam was, a pe was peccable. You and I are peccable. Able not to sin. Jesus was impeccable unable to sin his nature was sealed in righteousness and he could not act apart from the father and this is reflected in the relationship of their affection verse 20 for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and what is it that he is specifically referring to here what is it that Jesus is specifically referring to here in verse 20? That he has healed a man on the Sabbath. That's what he's, remember the context. That's what we looked at last week. That's what he's referring to in verse 20, that he, he healed a man, had the audacity to heal a man on the Sabbath. And he says, the father loves the son and shows him all that he's doing. In other words, everything the son does, including healing that man on the Sabbath is in direct complicity with the will of the Father. And goes on, verse 20, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Friend, what could have been more greater than what he did for that man at the pool of Bethesda? And yet greater works will he show him so that we can marvel. Verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Question, what could be greater, I ask you again, than giving a man, a lame man, legs to walk with? What could be greater? The resurrection. That's where we're headed this morning. 
In other words, Jesus says, I'll do more than heal their bodies. I'll heal their souls. I'll change their wills. I'll give them new lives. In fact, I'll give them eternal life. Greater things will be done. That's what he gives to those who accept his gift. He makes us, listen, he makes us sons and daughters. He doesn't just grow legs to walk. He gives us lives eternal. Verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus is the wise and worthy judge of our souls. And the just outcome of his judgment is to extend mercy to those who are already justly condemned. Verse 23. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Pretty bold statement right there, isn't it? Look at it again. That all may honor the Son just as they may honor the Father. Now we get it. 2,000 years ago, later, right? But put yourself in this first century context. Here's this man, and he's doing these miraculous things, and now he's saying, I deserve all the honor, just as you honor the Father. In other words, treat me just like you would the Father. Because, and here's why, the nature of God is seen in the behavior of the Son. The justice of God is, is upheld in the death of the Son. The holiness of God is met in the work of the Son. The truthfulness of God is exemplified in the person of His Son. And the grace of God is extended on behalf of the Son. You see, friends, that's a bold claim that no one else in the Bible can get away with. Tommy Nelson asked that question, and I think it's an appropriate one for us to ask this morning. So I ask you, do you think this man thinks he's God? I mean, so far when you're reading this thing, do you think this man, Jesus, thinks that he's God? And then he answered it, if he isn't, then somebody better tell him. This Jesus thinks he's God. Not a good teacher, not a moral example. He thinks he's God. And if he isn't, then he's a madman. C.S. Lewis put it very simply. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level of with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You, can't, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to do so. Can't say it any clearer than that. So, verse 23, Jesus goes on. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. In other words, here's what he's saying. All may honor the Son just as they honor the Father, and if whoever doesn't, doesn't honor the Father. In other words, if you refuse to worship me, you refuse to worship God. If my name, Jesus says, is not on your lips in worship, you're not worshiping the living God. The implication of that is raw. To renounce Jesus, to abandon him, to refuse to recognize him, to refuse to worship him. To renounce Jesus is to renounce God. He doesn't speak simply of the justice of God. He executes the justice of God. He doesn't simply prophesy of the grace of God. He reveals the grace of God. He doesn't simply offer the mercy of God. He qualifies the mercy of God. No one else claims this right to be worshipped, and no one is excused from worshipping him. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's how we worship God. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, now listen, let's pause there. 
Whoever believes, hears my word, and believes him who sent me. Now, let us make sure we understand. This is not simply belief in Jesus. That's not what he's referring to here. Or believing what he said or what he did. That's not the kind of believing that Jesus is talking about when he said, believe in him who sent me. No, this is belief that God sent him. And this one, Jesus says, if you believe that, that one, Jesus says, has eternal life. We don't receive the gift of eternal life because we were willing to admit that Jesus was right. We don't get eternal life because we come to terms with the fact the facts just speak for themselves. Okay, fine. Jesus is what he, okay, he's the son of God. I get it. That doesn't give us eternal life. We receive the gift of eternal life when we hear God's word, we believe it, and we put our faith in Jesus as the one who is not simply a convincing teacher, but who is the second person of the Trinity sent by the Father. That's when we receive eternal life, according to Jesus here. John, later on, having recorded this, would write the epistles, and in his first epistle, he said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which, is witness, which he has witnessed concerning his son. And this is the witness that God has given to us eternal life. And this life, listen, this life is in his son. And that person who hears Jesus' word and believes that he's God, on the basis of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, Jesus says, look, verse 24, he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to to life. Again, John will continue on in his epistle. He said, he that has the Son has life, that, and, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. You can't get any more clear than that, can you? If you've got Jesus, you've got life. If you don't have Jesus, you're dead. Verse 25, truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Let's make sure we understand what he's talking about here. This lost world is desperate in darkness. I'm telling you, if you don't, if you don't know that, you're not, your eyes are closed and you're, you're, you're out of touch entirely. You're living in a coma somewhere. This world is dying in darkness. And within it are all who are spiritually and eternally dead. But when God reveals the beauty of Christ. When God reveals the holiness of God against the ugliness of sin and the inescapable judgment for it, when you've got the holiness, when he begins to reveal the beauty of Christ and the holiness and his holiness, and you see it in contrast to the nasty that we see every day around us in the ugliness of sin, when through the, those gospel conversation, the wonderful grace of God's mercy is shown, and they hear the word of the Lord speak peace and forgiveness to their guilt, my friend, my friend, that grace, that message is efficacious. He says, those who hear, look at what he says, look at your Bible. Those who hear, look, will live. So go build an ark, Noah. Leave this land, Abram. Lead my people, Moses. Come down from that tree, Zacchaeus. Step away from that lifestyle, Mary Magdalene. Present yourself in the temple, leper. Put down your sword, Saul. When people hear the word of the Lord, they live. When Jesus speaks, people live. In the next chapter over, John's going to make this point. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Now listen, I want you to really wrap your mind around this. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Just pause, just, just think about that. All that the Father gives me will, not may, should, possibly, all the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. You want to know what God's will is? That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. 
For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I just did another funeral this past week. Doris Hughes, precious, wonderful woman, longtime member of this church, she and Boyd. And I'm going to tell you, I'm doggone tired of doing funerals. I've done my share. Nolan, we've done our share, haven't we? But the good news is, every time I step in the pulpit to do a funeral, you know what I can rest assured of? Is that when I'm doing a funeral for someone such as Doris Hughes, I know because God's word says God will raise her up on the last day. And I may be grieving the loss, that loved one may be grieving the loss, but friend, they can be comforted because that person will not stay in the ground. Jesus says, you put your faith in me, I will raise you up on the last day. Paul explained it a little further for us in Ephesians. He said, in him you also, listen, when you heard the word of truth. Now that's a key phrase right there. In him you also, when? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. Didn't just trust it, didn't just believe it was true, but you believed in him. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. In other words, here's what he's saying. Paul's telling us, when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you put your hope and your faith in him, and you believe his words when he says, on the last day I will raise you, here's what he does. His Holy Spirit seals you. And he keeps you until the last day. He will not let you go. You're here, and he does this. To God be the glory. Amen? That's a great comfort. Go ahead, tell Jesus you're happy about it. Why are all y'all clapping? Let's all clap. Tell Jesus we're happy about it. Absolutely. You ain't clapping me, you're clapping him. Hey, listen, here's the bottom line. If you're a Christian... That's your testimony. That's your testimony if you're a Christian. Look, he goes on, verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Verse 27, he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son. Of, here, here's what he's saying. It is the privilege of Christ to bestow life because of who he is. Jesus gets to give life because of who he is. He is God. We got these uh, lilies up here for a reason because today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that we celebrate, is the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem to begin that final leg of the journey to the cross. Now, let's for just a minute before we go into these final verses. Let's remember this, the significance of this day, Palm Sunday. But let's, let's focus right now for on Palm Sunday. And let's jump ahead. Let's go all the way in our minds and in our understanding of this text, to the final, that final entry into Jerusalem. It's the Passover week. Passover week for Israel in the first century was like a national family reunion of Jewish people. Uh, it's where it's every, everybody in the nation went to Jerusalem for the purpose. And on this particular day, when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem on that, Paso, on that Palm Sunday, when he's walking into and riding into Jerusalem, there are, is an estimated three, now listen, three million people in the city. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that's a, that's a crowded place right now with three million people in that one little small city. Matthew tells us that he came to Bethphage the, on the, to the Mount of Olives. We're more familiar probably with Bethany. We hear about the name Bethany and we wonder, is that the same city? It's really not. Bethany is a little city on the eastern slope of Mount Olive. Bethphage is believed to have just been to the northeast of Bethany. It'd be like a neighborhood. So you're in, uh, you're in uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and there's Hopewell right over here. That's what Bethphage would be. Jesus came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. There's a valley that runs along the Olivet, and it runs all the way to the eastern gate 
of the walls of Jerusalem. His entry at this particular gate is significant. It was prophesied by Ezekiel. Jesus enters through the eastern gate. And he enters, according to Ezekiel, on the colt of a donkey. Because over 500 years earlier, Zechariah prophesied that he would do just that. And so a huge crowd, and I want you to put yourself in the scenario of the first century Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's not for them. For them, it's the beginning of Passover. For us, we look back and it's Palm Sunday, but I want you to put yourself there. And a huge crowd is beginning to descend upon the city. They're praising God, and they're doing it loud. They're not quiet. They're not subdued. They're not worried about microphone reverberations and whatever. They're praising God, and they are loud. Imagine the excitement. Three million people buzz, 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 buzz. I mean, it's just electric in Jerusalem. They're praising God, and what is it they're talking about? What's on their minds, the majority of them, many of them? They're talking about the miracles that Jesus had just performed. Remember the lepers had just been healed? Remember the lame have been walking? By now, Bartimaeus has been healed of his blindness. Just a few days earlier, Lazarus has just been raised from the dead. Imagine what's going on in their minds on this particular occasion. Surely, this has to have been on their minds. Surely someone who was able to raise the dead would also be able to deliver the Jews from all their enemies. Surely now this was the one who could, who would restore them as a great and an independent nation. When Matthew tells us about it, he says the crowds went before him and they followed him and they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be the, him who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So there was rejoicing. But not everybody saw it this way. Luke tells us in his occasion, he says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because for them, the line's been crossed. In other words, teacher, tell them, tell them you're happy he's here. Let them tell them you're happy, they're happy you're here, but don't take a psalm of David and apply it to him. It's one thing to be celebrating. It's one thing to be happy, but don't. And goes back to our text this morning. Don't tell him he's God. And yet the events surrounding the city around the week will testify otherwise. Because as those events begin to unfold and the days progress, Jesus makes a prediction to his disciples. Matthew tells it for us. He says, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Two days before the, the events of the crucifixion begin, he makes that prediction that he's going to be handed over, delivered up to the Gentiles to crucify him. Now, if we're putting that on a calendar, if we're trying to calendar that, we'd likely put that on Wednesday, but it's probably more like Tuesday. Jesus would have been crucified on a Thursday, a Thursday morning, and he would have been pronounced dead between 3 and 4 p.m., and he would have been placed in a tomb that night. Dead Friday, dead Saturday, and then raised new life on Sunday. Resurrected, not resuscitated. Resurrected, there's a difference Verses 28 and 29 from John chapter 5 are what I believe is the, the preamble to the resurrection. Not just of his resurrection, but more specifically the preamble to our resurrection. Not just of Christian. Now listen, this is also important that we understand this. This preamble doesn't just describe the resurrection of the Christian. This preamble describes and speaks of the resurrection of everyone who has ever lived. The resurrection of every person who has ever walked this earth. Verse 28. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all, 
not believers, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. If we were to go around the room here and I was to ask you a question, don't answer this, but if I were to ask you, how many of you th knew that the wicked will be resurrected, that the resurrection is for them too? You, many of us would have said, oh, I don't know, I thought the resurrection was for Christians. No, 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 no. All who have ever walked this earth who have ever breathed this air, who have ever felt the sun on their face, all will be resurrected. I don't know of a clearer picture of a fork in the road than that which is given in these two verses. For those whose faith is in Christ, our resurrection is anticipated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, listen, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, listen, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Friend, if Christ is raised from the dead, then we will be there. Our salvation is tied to a future event. Job, faith in God, said, For I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, you hear that? After my skin is destroyed, in my flesh, I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. <laughs> That's a dancing moment there, folks. But, verses 28 and 29 make it very clear that the resurrection is not just for Christians. Everyone will experience the resurrection. Some to endure heaven and some to endure hell. Those two verses, verses 28 and 29, I think answer six essential questions for us this morning. Number one, I'm just going to give them to you. Number one. Does everyone go to heaven? No. Answered. Number two. Can you get to heaven on your terms? No. Answered. Number three. Does consciousness end at death? In other words, do we slip into eternal annihilation? No. Number four, can I work my way into God's favor? No. Number five, is there a second chance after death? Is there a purgatory? Is there something else after I breathe my last where God says, all right, now, I'm, I'm, you, you got to take me serious here. Is there a second chance after you breathe your last? No. And number six, is believing enough? This is a tough one. Is believing enough? In other words, just Believing it. Is that enough? Nope. Not according to verses 28 and 29. If your, if your hope rests on any of those six things, 
And, and if you don't hear anything else I say ever, hear me when I say this. If your hope rests on God sending everybody eventually to heaven, on you working things out with God and getting to heaven on your own terms, on some kind of idea that you're just, no, there's nothing else after death, or that you're going to work it out because you're going to find way with God's favor, or because you're going to get a second chance after dying, or that you were a believer in the sense that you believed what the Bible said, and you went to church, and you paid your tithe, and you did all those things because, gee whiz, I just think it's true. It just makes sense. Friend, if that's what you're resting your hope in, your resurrection will be unto judgment but if your hope rests in true faith then your resurrection will be unto life thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church while we are so glad you were able to listen we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church if you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.